you guys see this? This whole business of, you know, supposed weather spy balloons. This idea that you would be in your home or work environment chilling out and there's a weather balloon out there, but really it's a spy drone. The idea that someone would use something as innocuous and as domestically seen all around and that it could be spying on you absolutely Hello and welcome back and that's right it's time for another review of a Synology NAS and today we are looking at this something for the home users. I've not said the word Synology and something for the home users for a very long time and this the DS223 is the new value series NAS from the brand that is the now I would say almost over five years refresh since the DS218 before arriving with a new CPU and to be perfectly frank not a huge amount of other differences on it. This is their two bay entry point into the world of Synology, their ecosystem and DSM. Before we go any further though a few disclaimers. Number one yes this is going to be a long review the reviews are always long but there will be a much 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 much, much shorter before you buy in the next five to seven days. That one's going to be much much shorter and going through the five bullet points of each. This video is designed for those of you that are considering buying this NAS and are either out of the loop when it comes to Synology's hardware and software or two you just need a quick refresher so it's going to cover as much as possible hence the length of the video but again you want the short version it's coming in a few days and that will just cover all of the bullet points for you but for now who is this for the DS223 because I'll be honest with you anyone that's spoken to me that is into their tech or has built their own computers or has owned a Synology NAS previously would be forgiven to look at this and go that is not some exciting hardware. It really is not. When you look at the hardware, this device has got an ARM and ARM based processor, which are designed predominantly for energy efficient devices, tablets, phones, and smaller end devices that are, you know, designed to be on 24 7, maybe on battery power, never switched off. This CPU is designed to use as little power as possible and be as efficient as possible there. That does mean compromises, particularly when you compare it against more powerful devices that are running on AMD or Intel x86 64-bit processors, your 920, your 923, your 1621, even all the way up to the Xeons. This is not designed to live in that bracket. This is meant to be for people that want to take their first tibbity toes into the world of DSM and their first home NAS. And the word home is enormous here. Two words you're going to hear me say a lot, home and value uh, throughout the whole course of this video. And this device knocking around in the UK. Again, prices, it's just been launched. So again, you're looking at 24250 in the UK, in the US, 299, maybe around 310, 320. Again, factor in your local tax and delivery. And in the bulk of Europe, in uh, those that have got the euro, it is 280 to about 300 euros there. So again, when you compare it to the price point of the likes of the DS73 uh, that we talked about a while ago, that was well into the 400s, uh, maybe the 450s getting close to the 500s, it is definitely a more affordable price point there. And with that, you have access to the likes of uh, Synology's DSM platform, around 70 to 80% of the applications that we'll talk about later on. Um, you've got a two year warranty included with it there. And I would argue, it isn't just a light taster of all the apps and services. That quad core arm and the two gig of memory it arrives with actually opens the door to a number of services. They've even managed to get some of the other uh, mainstay Synology applications that weren't really available um, on ARM processor to be moved over to this. Not a lot of the big ones, forget VMs, forget Active Backup, they're not on there, but a number of the others are, and stuff like Snapshot, Snapshot Replication, stuff like that. But let's talk a little bit about the box and the retail packaging. You know how exciting that is. And frankly, this is clearly designed to live on the shelf of your local IT shop. Yes, most of you are going to buy it on the internet, but... I would argue, much like Synology's other home, more compact devices, it's nice, it looks like it's standard brown box plain packaging there, but all around the device, the printed information all the way around it is very specific to the DS223 there. If we have a look inside, I will say, I have already unboxed this, I've done a lot of the testing in advance for this, for this video, and I've got some other videos coming up on this soon with multimedia and such, but I will say the packaging on this is a bit meh. 
Um, it's not going to give it a tremendous amount of protection, particularly, you know, this isn't provided pre-populated, but if you're going to buy one of these from a shop that says they include the storage and they'll install it, make sure they package it well, because this device doesn't afford a huge amount of protection. That's the unit right there on the top there. It's single layer cardboard packaging. I know it's dull, but for those of you that have ever had a damaged unit in, pass in transit, you know, shock damage, crush damage, motion damage, these things matter. Um, we've got our quick start installation guide there. Again, you can use that, but it's very straightforward to set up. Arguably, if you're watching my collab the other day uh, with SpaceRex on the 20 things that we would change about Synology, it might not be as user-friendly as some of you might like in terms of switching it on and turning a key, but it's actually quite straightforward to set up. Um, inside, we've got our external PSU, 60 watt external power brick there, Synology branded. Uh, UK main seed, again, wherever you are in the world, you're gonna get your plug there. You've got a uh, Cat5e uh, ethernet cable there. This is a one GBE box, we'll talk about that more later on. And you've got screws for two and a half inch media. It supports one to two hard drives inside. And again, they've gotta be SATA and or uh, SSDs if you choose. And then you've got the unit itself in this nice little cloth bag. Again, just cardboard inside, there's no foam. And I know there is a balance to be struck between the cost of a unit during development and uh, production and presentation, you know, environmental concerns to make sure you're not being wasteful or depressive of the device in transit, but also you've got to protect the device. These are being built, you know, frankly for most of us on the other side of the world and they're, the way they are shipped and how they're protected in transit. I just think I would have liked to have seen a little bit more protection other than this cardboard structure there inside. Um, if we have a little look about the inside of the bag, it's still oozing with that Synology charm. We've got the unit in that familiar chassis. First debuted um, in the DS, I believe, 218 plus all those years ago. This is probably one of my favorite Synology cases. It's compact. Uh, my original uh, kind of uh, perspective on this chassis, if I remember way, way, way back during my early reviews, I always compared this packaging to uh, when the movie Robocop, the remake, came out. And I compared this casing to that. I still maintain that, the kind of rebooted Robocop look there. It's kind of slick, but it's still angular. It's um, smoothed edges combined with those sharp kind of curves there. And again, matte black. There isn't any other colours available for this, but... I quite like the average design of it. The accessories are what I would expect, the external PSU. Again, it's a two bay, getting the power supply small enough and then installing it inside on a chassis this big, you've got to talk think temperature concerns, but also just an internal PSU doesn't make sense here. So an external one, also the ease of replacement makes a great deal of sense there. We'll move those out of there. At the casing there, we can take a little close look up front. But to be honest, I think we shouldn't just take a quick glance at it. Let's take a moment to admire the hardware and chassis design of the DS223. Now, straight away, I will say with this device, it runs real quiet. During a lot of my software testing of this device, some of which you'll see later in the video, I was running this on a couple of 8TB WD Red hard drives inside here. And even though they were pro class drives, this ran real quiet. Now, there are a lot of reasons why that is. First and foremost, it is a completely plastic chassis all the way around. We've got a metal internal uh, kind of framework there keeping it together. Also, ventilation on this device is just a one. Not only have you got obviously the Synology branded uh, kind of vent panels there on the side, that oh so slick charm that we've seen before on this chassis with that device or the ventilation at all times. And of course you've got the rear mounted fan. Again, operational automatic manual, it's up to you. You've got additional ventilation there on the bottom as well. What I really like is despite um, the fact that we have this front panel here that is removable, I'll show you in just a moment. The way that front panel has been designed, we, I saw it during its operation when I had some work happening with the roof here in my office, when there was a bit of dust around, you can probably see some of the dust there on the top, that the vent there, there is an air slit there built into the base. Along the top, there's an air slit there that's slightly angled. And on the inside there, we have another air slit again, angled there in line with the airflow so this system 
is you know kind of really deceivingly well ventilated not just those side panels it's got the ventilation on the back and all of that around the front which means that unlike my criticism of some NASs in the past that have got front panels on the front which can impede horizontal airflow they've really put the time in on this front bit now the front panel isn't magnetized i will say it's got these four kind of rubbery suction things uh, that kind of nestle in between the drives i'm kind of for and against that i'll get onto that later on but if you look at the front there we've got individual leds there based on the top again system network status drive health that sort of thing again you can dim those you can increase the brightness no lcd panel on this and again you've got the apps to access it there so that's up to you one thing I will highlight, of course, those of you who have followed the channel for a while, the fact that it's got a front-mounted USB port and button there. Now, I'm going to get old school for you, like an old fool. The USB on that device, having a USB port on this, despite it being USB 3.2 Gen 1, 5 gigabit, something I'll touch on later, I like that this device, specifically because of its home user appeal, has a one-touch copy button there why because a lot of home users that go for a nas like this they will treat this like a backup they might even think raid is a backup which it bloody well isn't they might go ahead and put two drives inside back up all of their stuff to this have it in the corner and then they think their backup's fine and they start deleting photos from their phone and deleting files then it's not a backup anymore you've only got one stage there and then that data only exists there so it is, you know, there's many, many compelling arguments why anyone, particularly a home user, who's got photos and maybe information that is genuinely irreplaceable and genuinely priceless because you can't put a price on it because you can't replace it. These, for these users, having another tier of a backup strategy may be tremendously important, but it's also quite cost prohibitive. And for those users, I will always recommend just as an entry into your backup. A little USB backup. Get yourself a little USB drive to back up onto. But it's one, either having an automated system to back it up or knowing the backup's going to be done. And whether it is that you're backing up data to the NAS or you're backing up data from your overall setup over here that's non-network applicable onto the device, having a one-touch copy button allows you to connect that drive and using the USB copy app within DSM, one click and then that backup begins. And whatever the rules of retention, whatever the rules of filters, whatever the rules of file sizes, whatever the rules of directories that you have set up on that backup, it will action. You'll know it's actioning it because the light will go crazy town banana pants. Now, yes, you don't need to do it manually. You can just have a USB connected there all the time. And then you can have a schedule backing it up onto it and just untick the box where it auto dismounts the USB, fine. And you can also set it up that the backup will automatically trigger when the drive is connected. But I know, much like a lot of gamers that don't trust autosave and go manual save, that having a button is a compelling argument for a lot of less kind of IT versed or less IT or techie trusting users. So having a USB copy button, which I know I've wasted three or four minutes of your time on, um, on a device of this scale, is going to be a lot more appealing to home users. And I'm really glad they've got it on here especially when we were reviewing recently uh, something for another video soon the ds723 plus a beefier more powerful synology that doesn't have the copy button on the front and only has one usb this has three one on the front two on the back all usb three so it's the little things that i think home users will appreciate on this now removing that front panel, which you can have a look on the inside there, there's those rubberized panels I mentioned there. They nestle between all of those drives. And as you can see, going back to that subject of ventilation, there is a ton of ventilation around those drives. You can already make out the fan on the rear of the device there. Now, these trays, you can get ahead, go ahead with populating this device with just one drive if you choose. You can put in two, then take advantage of RAID 0 and RAID 1. There's even support of Synology Hybrid RAID. More on that on the software portion. But although on a two-bay a lot of you might think, well, who cares? you know Synology Hybrid RAID I can mix and match my drives but I've only got two in there I'm not going to see the benefits yes it will you know the benefits of SHR on a system at this scale isn't huge and you can't use an expansion there's no expansion support you can swap out the drives but you can you know replace drives in a normal RAID what's the appeal of SHR on this nice and simple if they in the line because remember this is an entry point first NAS if later on you decide to upgrade to something a bit beefier and you want to carry your data over reuse those drives then SHR is appealing. 
because then you can take those two drives, pop them in a four bay, then take advantage of the mixed drive benefits of SHR there. Now the drives, they unclick from the top. There's no physical locking mechanism on this. There is just the button there that holds them in place. Again, just before we go through the drives, you can have a little look. There is that rear fan there on the rear, directly covering the drives. On the inside, we've got a flat panel there, no access to a memory. You can't upgrade the memory. There's no M2 NVMEs on this. Think value. Uh, on the other side, direct access to the ventilation panel there. On the inside, put that to one side. Oh, and sorry, and at the back, you can just make out those individual SATA connectors there. Combined data and power, no loose cables knocking around. Nice and straightforward. Let's talk about the trays. Plastic click and load. Screw holes at the bottom there for two and a half inch media if you choose. But again, the majority are going to go for hard drives on this. Now, let's talk hard drive compatibility because that is something that Synology in the last 12 to 18 months has sort of been, you know, back and forthing and niggling some users a little bit. That is to say about what drives this supports. Now, I'm pleased to say, unlike a lot of the XS and higher tier devices, we've seen Synology be perhaps a touch more prohibitive about the supported list of compatible drives. This has got that full range of compatible drives on there. More on that on the software portion later, but WDC gate or works, they're all supported on there. So you can go ahead and use Synology's own hard drives if you choose. Again, you can do that. They will be super noisy. It will, you know, a drive like this will make a lot of racket in a chassis like this. Alternatively, um, although they're not on the compatibility list, and because the, the Synology compatibility list only goes to 18 TB, I have already tested 20 TB drives like this one, the Seagate Ironwolf Pro 20 TB. Again, super loud in this chassis, but you can use large drives, which means this two bay has a potential 40 TB in a RAID era or 20 TB in a RAID one. But for my testing, I've gone ahead and utilized WD's uh, drives for the test later on in this video. And again, installation, you just remove the clips on the side. You take your drive, you slot it in. It's very hard to get this wrong, by the way. Um, who knows, I might prove you wrong. Uh, you can put it in there, replace the clips, hold the drive in place, and it's as straightforward as that. Again, make sure you use the arrow, slot it straight in, wallop it's that straightforward and again you can get away with running a one drive temporarily if you choose and until your budget allows and then install another drive just make sure you've got your backups in order there uh, and again if you go for a j board or just a single drive there you can even set it up in an expansive way where you can go ahead if you choose to add another drive later on and just expand to the raid accordingly just make sure you do the right the raid in the correct direction there We'll slot that inside. There is our second drive, and it's that straightforward. We got our upper panel there on the front. Pop it on. I'm not tremendously in love with the way that sits on there. I kind of wish it was magnetic. I think sometimes you can put it in there and it feels like you're really forcing it on. It's definitely a two hand op. But overall, the chassis design on this I will always like. This two bay chassis is probably one of my favorite ones out there. But that's enough about the design of this chassis. Let's talk about those ports and connections. Now, don't get too comfortable. This is not going to be a long section. Uh, in the case of this device, the ports and connections are actually few and far between. Now, given its price point and its you know entry-level value position in the Synology portfolio, that's not a huge surprise indeed. In recent videos in the last six to eight months, I have you know been quite continuous in my criticism of Synology utilizing one gigabit Ethernet ports and USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, given that most other NAS brands right now are rolling out 2.5 GPE and 10 um, gig USB ports on their system however this is still a value series device it is designed as an entry point into their ecosystem and yes you know 250 300 nicker is not a small amount of money but once you factor in the synology software with this that the majority of synology nas is a rolling is kind of their big selling point that usb for the platform I would say that I'm less critical of this system only having US, uh, having USB 3.2 Gen 1 5 gig and only having one GBE. I don't like that it's only one port. That kind of annoys me, although a lot of home users, very few of them are going to take advantage of multi-path, lag, port trunk, that sort of thing. But still, only having the one port on there already gives you a bottleneck. And again, we talked about it in other videos, but with ISPs exceeding one gigabyte uh, in their performance, there is the potential that an external cloud could in the right setup and the right file types and the right connection and distance you could get faster than this with a cloud service uh, not just the internet service but the actual cloud you're connecting with so 
I'm kind of surprised if they're not going to put 2.5 GB on this, even on a value tier, that they didn't put a couple of ports on there. But nonetheless, I'm not going to rag them too much for that. Now, one gig, when you go through Synology's own uh, performance charts, and again, there is an article linked below where Eddie's put together a comparison of the current range of two bays in the market right now. You'll find that in terms of 1 GPU, that CPU and the memory combo inside this is able to saturate that 1G absolutely fine like anyone else. It's just a shame that that's really the height you're ever going to go. Um, I'm pleased, as mentioned earlier, about the additional USB ports on this. Having three in total for home users is going to be very, very appealing indeed. Because, again, whether you can use multiple external drives, you're going to pop in a tiny little UPS there. It's good to have that amount of connectivity. What is annoying is still, even now, there is no official Synology support a 2.5 to USB adapters or 5 GBE to USB adapters. You know, if you're not going to give people 2.5 GBE or greater than 1 GBE at the same price as, you know, uh, as 1 GBE, at least give people the option to upgrade. People have already made uh, unofficial uh, patches and little uh, GitHub kind of um, upgrades there that have allowed people to use 2.5 and 5 GB adapters on DSM-7. It is worth highlighting that again there's every possibility that a new DSM update comes out and all of that gets completely undone and therefore stability is a question but still I'm really surprised Synology if they're not going to give people 2.5 GPU to just roll out their own of these devices. We've talked about it at length in other videos it just seems a no-brainer to me but that's kind of systemic of DSM. The rollback of USB support on that platform is actually quite large. We've seen a huge drop since DSM 6.2 of supported USB peripherals, office devices, um, uh, uh, wireless adapters, dongles, that sort of thing. It's really been rolled back. So as good as it is to have those three ports, bear in mind that really it's UPSs and storage that they're going to be used for, and that's about your lot. Again, the connectivity on this, there's no way to upgrade that connectivity uh, with a, an improved network interface, even adding further 1GBE ports, in fact. On top of that, there's no expansion port on eSATA, so the sky, you know, the sky limit being a lot lower on this device, bear in mind that your two drives is where it ends in terms of expanding within this system. But I don't really, again, with the audience this is intended for, I can't really be that critical i can say what i would wish and again synology would argue that if i want those things why don't i upgrade to that 723 there but still it would have been nice to have them on there and maybe let's face it a ds223 plus or whatever their next home media two bay that's going to be soon whatever they want to call it that comes whatever that is that's going to be if not 2.5 gpu that's going to be a couple of lands so this Within the context of that portfolio, whether you're looking at the existing ranges like the DS220 Plus or anything up and coming in the next few months, I think it makes a lot more sense. So I'm not a big fan, but I can't be too critical of it personally. But let's grab ourselves a screwdriver and have a little look at the internal hardware. Now, dismantling the chassis was no easy task. We had to remove a screw and the fan from the rear there. Then you have to kind of jimmy the inside there where there is a metal bar. But getting into the inside, it all didn't give us a great deal more. We can see the individual drive trays there and the framework there that's holding the drives in place as well as those SATA connectors at the top. It is underneath this panel here where our CPU and memory lives within this system. So not in this video, but I'm probably gonna to have to take this whole device apart for either a follow-up video or a link in the description. So hopefully that's down there below. But we can talk a little bit more about this system architecture. So first and foremost, let's talk about it, that CPU, the Realtek RTD 1619B. Now that B is very important, uh, at least to some users, because the RTD 1619 is the newer generation of uh, Realtek ARM, kind of fully featured 64-bit processors particularly not just for nas but certainly for home server and home multimedia server and multimedia box use that's a very capable processor but the non-b version is actually a six core version with a slight improvement on the graphics not a lot tiniest bit but the 1619b version is still an upgrade over that of the rtd um uh, one two six uh, one two six nine 
96, I should say, on the previous generation, the 218, the 118, the 418, the 220 Play, and many, many, many other NASs that have arrived in the last three to four years. Now, what that CPU means with its quad-core architecture and 1.7 gigahertz clock speed, only a pinch, 0.3 gigahertz more than its predecessor there. It's got more power to utilize, but it's also better with it and which is kind of the main purpose of a refresh within any product family from Synology. Now it does have 4k support there we've already done testing you'll see it later on of playing 4k files and indeed we are going to be doing multimedia testing in a completely separate video to this where we look at its capabilities however it doesn't transcode. Now it does theoretically have native transcoding on board depending on the complexity of the file that is being transcoded so if you're going to go with 720 1080p there you want to convert down you'll probably be okay but more complex stuff like HEVC compression particularly 4k is going to be off the table both natively and using third-party multimedia applications now VMs off the table containers off the table the docker app isn't available for this and although Traditional storage and a lot of Synology's own range of applications are going to be available on this with that CPU support, including Synology Photos, including the collaboration suite, the backup tools, surveillance, that sort of thing. I will highlight that with this device, it's 2 gig of fixed memory. It's quite a low ceiling. Yes, you're still using an ARM, and in most processes where there could be a potential power bottleneck, the CPU, in a lot of cases, will be the first one um, to, you know, to cry horse first but when it comes to that memory being two gig there will be users out there running larger databases and lot higher frequency of files rather than um, volume of files that would have benefited from that large amount of memory this system arriving with two gig isn't a huge surprise when it's come to this product family of value series from Synology the value and the J series have always arrived with between 512 uh, megabytes unbelievable of memory 1 gig or 2 gig depending on the configuration you go for between 1 bay 2 bay and 4 bay and we fully anticipate this hardware configuration making its way over to the, a newer generation 1 uh, play uh, not play series but J series two bay we think play is dead and buried unfortunately um, and the four bay series in the near future I just wish they would up that two gig particularly when you look at its place in the portfolio something we talked about before between I hate seagulls so so much um, I, I think its place in a larger portfolio becomes a little bit blurrier when the only difference between this and a potential follow-up DS223 Plus and uh, the idea of other value series to box boxes, that memory seems like a weird trade-off point with the cost of memory these days. Also, that memory is soldered to the board. It's not a sodium. You can't just throw it away and stick in a new one there. It is directly soldered to the board. That's not surprising. That's generally what you get with a lot of these ARM-based processors that they're all built around the idea of direct to board connection there. It's not a bad CPU, and again, within the value structure of things, it does give you the range of full Synology services. There isn't an EM2 upgrade slots there. There's no additional way to add cache. Whether cache is supported via the individual bays, I could stick in a SATA SSD and let you know, but it's a two bay. What a tremendous waste of everyone's time that would be. But I think that is enough talk about the hardware. Let's get all of this put back together and make our way back onto DSM and have a little look about what's available and not available from the Disk Station Manager on the DS223. And here we are on the desktop of DSM 7, or 7.1 I should say, running here on the DS223. And I think a lot of you that have been following Synology now for a number of years, maybe you'd seen how old the previous generation Realtek, that DS218 was, and you were thinking, well, I'm going to sit on the fence a bit longer. I'm sure a lot of you who have been following Synology are wondering what exactly is included in this, but more importantly, what isn't included? Because again, this is an entry level device, something we're gonna, you know, we've really banged on a lot in this video. But straight away off the bat, I will say that the bulk of Synology applications are here. So, for example, uh, whether you want to go into the device itself and look into the app center and go through the list, or you can just strictly go directly to Synology right now as the page becomes live and you can see the apps that are included. And I'll tell you straight away. Some of the apps that are missing there that I would argue I didn't expect to see here anyway, things like Active Backup Suite 
it is a great application, but this isn't going to be the sort of device that's going to have that kind of hardware to support an application of that stature. The same goes for Synology High, high Availability. That is not available here because you do need quite a snappy little system to have a decent amount of spare resources to maintain that active-passive relationship. Um, but one application I'm kind of surprised is missing, and I know I've mentioned this elsewhere in the video, um, Plex Media Server is absent on this NAS at the moment. And I know, although it's not a Synology application and therefore we're not going to be critical of Synology here for this, but it's worth highlighting a lot of you that are going to be buying this rather, you know, entry-level affordable NAS here are doing it so you can have your own media server. And Plex Media Server not being on here, it's nothing to do with Synology at this time. If you go over to Plex themselves, they've just not developed a client for this. So at the moment, if you go into Plex own website there, you've got two little entries for um, uh, Plex Media Server on a Synology. You've got one listed for DSM-7 and one just listed as Synology. I've gone ahead and downloaded both of those um, x86 versions that you can see there. And I've already downloaded them and I've tried to install each one of them. And even if you try to install any of these with a manual installation, and again, I've tried three different file types here, trying to install them, it's just getting nowhere. It either spits out that it's not suitable for this system or that it needs um, to be utilized in a different system, or as you can see there, requires DSM 7.04000, even though, quite clearly, I am running a much uh, newer version of DSM on this system here. So, again, I think this is something that Plex themselves are going to have to take care of, but for now, if you're looking at this now as for Plex, it's not really an option for you, but more on multimedia later. Um, another thing uh, I would talk about here with this device, when it comes to utilizing it, um, even though in its default state, Right now, as you can see, that CPU is at very low end use and the memory there at 28%, even though I've got quite a lot of apps sitting there, you know, kind of hibernating there in the background waiting to be used, CPU spikes on this device are all too common. And that's something that anyone going for an ARM or ARM powered NAS needs to be aware of because Although the CPU is quad core and it's 1.7 gigahertz per core, when you are running processes, um, it's suddenly going to have to shift a lot of gears into it. So the CPU, unlike a lot of Intel or some of those AMD 64-bit processors, where you start seeing CPU at 7%, 10%, 17%, 17%, ARM-based processors, and you know this device is no exception, will suddenly hit 25, suddenly hit 40, 50, 60% at the you know change of wind so just bear that in mind but in, as far as dsm itself is concerned it runs the bulk of the mainstay packages very very well so again i've done the poll review of dsm 7.1 it will be linked in the description below it's like an hour long so if you have come to this video to learn about dsm watch that review this is just going to skim the surface but going into the storage manager immediately Again, you've got support of Synology Hybrid RAID, you've got support of BTRFS, you've got support of snapshots there and archival snapshots as well, and remote replication snapshots, so it's all like snippy snappy built in there. In terms of hard drive compatibility, something again we touched on earlier, I'm pleased to say that hard drive compatibility there is a great deal broader uh, than we've seen on some of the XS or Enterprise level series there, so as you can see... The traditional brands are all listed in there. And although I'm still not in love with the idea, they're still only listing as high as 18 TB. Well, we know, you know, darn well, we've tested larger hard drives than 18 TB on the Synology platform. I'm still quite pleased that it still has that open compatibility. There's still the floating question mark of Synology producing their own regular class hard drive. And again, that's looking increasingly likely. But still, at least there's open compatibility on this system when you set it up for the first time. And that support of Synology Hybrid RAID, as good as that is, it's arguable that it's not hugely relevant on this device because you, there's no support of an expansion device. And when you're putting those additional drives in, SHI is only really going to be useful on this device if you're, you know, you want a less complicated upgrade of individual drives. It's a great thing. And maybe if you're going to upgrade this to a new NAS later, then SHR will be very beneficial. But in of itself, it's, you know, it's so-so. Um, so coming out of that storage manager there, let's look at the baseline package. And I think a lot of you out there are going to want to know about how well this runs drive because a lot of users that go into the Synology platform do so because the ecosystem is so darn appealing. Um, for a lot of you that want that complete 
all app hardware software turnkey package there and that's not for everyone because the hardware on this now is going to put some users off but i would say that sonology drive runs great on this device so to put that into a little bit of perspective there we've already got drive set up there i've even set up the drive client and set it up there so for those of you um who are thinking about having this NAS to kind of centralize a lot of your work and backups there. I'm quite pleased to say that again, adding this to your range of available drives, you can see there on the left hand side of the screen, is very straightforward. And again, going in, I've already added a bunch of drives. We've got the support, of course, of file pinning. So if we choose, we can go in, go to the Synology Drive Manager, create a permanent copy of that file. We can just, you know, browse the file whenever we want, and it will hold it for like 30 days, depending on the retention policy. And indeed, all of these files here you can see, if we look at them here, they are taking up zero space on the disk. You can see the size of the file, but it's taking up zero space on the disk. That's the beauty of these live sync on demand files there. And again, support of Synology Office is available on the DS223. So if we go back into that team folder there, the Plex folder, we can open up that PDF within our web browser. We can view it in the web browser, of course, or if we choose, we can open it up in Synology Office uh, with the editing suite of if you use the package. So for example, here is a power usage chart that I was utilizing uh, during our uh, power consumption video series into a spreadsheet with our calculator there. There it is being viewed in the web browser and opened up in Synology Office. We can now edit this file as we choose, just like we would if we were using you know, Google Sheets or Office 365. And again, you can import it to a Synology format if you choose. It's nice and straightforward there, and that's included with the device uh, uh, by default. Synology Drive is a great synchronization tool, and again, we've done whole dedicated videos on it, but you've got support of, again, uh, the whole Office suite built into that there, and that includes um, uh, PPTX files as well. Now, Although we don't have uh, support of Active Backup Suite, we do have support of the rest of the mainstay uh, backup applications there. So for example, we can go into Hyper Backup there as well as USB Backup as well. So we'll open up on there. Hopefully my eyes are working. I should have set that to an alphabetical list. So for example, I've already set up uh, a couple of USBs there. Um, I've set up a couple of USB routines connected to a USB drive within the system uh, mounted onto the front of the device. And again, setting up a backup there, one touch, and it's having those three USB ports that although I would argue I'm not tremendously in love with USB 5 gigabits per second, again, this is a value system, so I'm prepared to change my perspective just a little bit there. And having three ports, again, for your backups, for your UPS, it's quite nice. And again, adding them there, really, really straightforward, and it's the idea that you've got that both-way directional backup there for your home users, as well as if we choose to for, um, if we want to... Uh, import data or export so in other words back the nas up to the usb or back the usb up to the nas on the clicking off that button so we go for uh, import there and we can go for multi-versional we can go for mirroring incremental and again all of those rules will be set up within that single backup routine not just the whole thing and you can trigger and change a lot of the file filters the retention policies that sort of thing all based in there um, when it comes to hyper backup this is when you want to back up either in either direction, the NAS to the cloud, the NAS to the USB, the NAS to another NAS, a NAS to with another folder within the system. And again, all of that really, really straightforward and no different to what we've seen in other Synology platforms. Just bear in mind, again, as you can see, that CPU is doing those spikes up there that process is being handled by that Realtek processor. It just needs a little bit more oomph for the average task. It's more efficient than the RTD 1296 that came before it four or five years ago, but at the same time, it's still an ARM. The support of different platforms within those backups there, again, if you know about Synology, you know this already, but for the rest of you, there's quite a wide range of backup destinations you can go with, along with support of their own cloud service, of course. But so we make it nice and easy for ourselves just to show it off, because I've already set up a cloud backup there, but so we go for a local folder there, we can go ahead, Select a folder, so we go with the video folder there, we then um, we can carry on to the next page from there, Open it up. We can say what folder within that subfolder we want to go with um, for the, the data backup. Oh, it's not going to let us do that one because it's within the same folder array. So it's going to have a problem with it. 
Again, we can choose if we're going to the application backup during that process as well. That's completely optional. Then you've got uh, kind of the policies and the backup settings. Where does he want it to run on a schedule? And, you know, do you want these to be checked as well? Next up, rotational backups. So if you're running, for example, you want this backup every day, but you want to maintain it for a certain number of days, what you can do is after the seventh one, if you choose on a week policy, overwrite the oldest one, and you can set that to quite a good customizable range. And again, support of versioning, always beneficial. I should add Synology Drive has versioning as well. Uh, which is quite nice too. So for those of you looking for a nice synchronized backup routine, or even just live sync uh, data within the NAS to local systems, this is going to be a great benefit. And again, you can add a numerous uh, levels of cloud platforms there to back up to and from. On the subject of cloud, there is still the addition of cloud sync from Synology there. So cloud sync this is when you can synchronize your cloud platform provider. And again, several different kinds of cloud storage there, some of them bucket-based, some of them quite domestic level. You can uh, synchronize that cloud space. So if you want, when you're using your phone, your laptop on the go, and you don't want to connect with the NAS remotely, more on that in a moment, you can always utilize cloud platforms that you may already have some space included with your phone or whatever data plan provider you've got. Then synchronize that cloud space existing or otherwise with your NAS. There's no currently no uh, Google Photos tool um, from Synology to synchronize there. They have their own tools there, so even synchronizing that metadata, the JSON stuff isn't there. But still, it's nice to have the backup of those cloud services be so easy to synchronize. And then when they are synchronized, they can appear on your list of drives here. But it's not really as a mounted drive, just as uh, visible storage. So moving away from those cloud storage providers, we can talk a little bit about multimedia. This is not going to be a business NAS. This is going to be a NAS for those of you at the lower end of the spectrum, maybe adding it on to your existing NAS um, as another backup tier, or it's just a simple sharing tool for your in-house or uh, with your friends, family, and colleagues. So the multimedia suite is, you know, pretty much what you expected before. So, for example, Audio Station to play music within the web browser as I mute this, just in case I end up uh, getting this video uh, in trouble. We've got, again, we've added it all there. We can use the Audio Station tool as well as, of course, there are client applications as well. If we head to the App Center that you can download uh, that can be utilized, uh, so desktop tools and more, that allow you to synchronize this with your local PC or Mac or Linux system as well as tools for Amazon Fire TV as well, that allow you to synchronize your music in your home multimedia environment. There's even support of an app for the Alexa that allows you to voice command and request music to be played via the Alexa speaker from your NAS, something that only really Synology provide in a first party way. Other platforms have to use things like uh, the My Media tool for Alexa, a third party one there. Um, Again, moving forward, there's a DLNA media server, of course, as I scroll through to try to find them. Really should have put those in alphabetical order. Um, and again, you can set that up for your media to be found on the local area network via a universal plug and play, uh, UPNP and DLNA. Uh, on top of that, then you can go into photos. There is support of Synology's photo application. Uh, as my brain is going fuzzy and I can't find it, it's down there. Um, and Synology photos application is the worth highlighting by default that AI facial recognition is disabled by default. Now, I imagine the reason that photo recognition, uh, facial recognition disabled by default in the settings is because it's going to use a decent amount of CPU and hardware to do it. But again, you just head in to the main menu, go to the top, go in, go to settings, scroll to the bottom, and you can enable it there. So the option's there, but it is disabled by default, something some people may miss. There's even the scraping of that metadata there as well. So you've got the majority of those services. You've got access to that uh, share space or private space. You've got the option to utilize those filters, which again is quite nice to have on a local NAS system that is you know, quite low end. And again, you don't need the internet to run these services. You can run this without internet access. It's all being done within the system and at the same time if we find a photo let's find a ridiculous photo of my cat i don't know what's going on with my cat in this photo we can have a look at the information that's attached to it and then from that you can find out a little bit more about stuff that's happening unfortunately that photo does not have the kind of metadata that we want to see let's go and see if we can find a photo with some decent metadata unfortunately it's not there don't worry again it does scrape the metadata there otherwise how could it have found 
um, a lot of that information before uh, for the place data. But yeah, you can quick filter, create quick folders, and you've got those different share settings for yourself there. So if you do create an album, for example, let's randomly create that we're going to go we want photos taken within 2020 i'd say it'll be those and then what i can go ahead is start creating myself a smart intelligent album there so again let's go ahead and pick all the photos from this time here we can then add to a brand new album so again we've got the option to add an album download them directly share them remotely from our desktop but let's put them in a new album we'll call this new album test album Click that, and now this is now processing and creating a new album. Again, you're going to see those spikes in activity while we're doing this, and this is a fairly small task, but as you can see, we've now created that test album. And then from here, if we choose, we can go ahead and share this album, and again, we can do share link, and from the share link, we can choose if it's going to be an internal or external share link, although, again, internet connectivity uh, required. And from there, you can change the rules. Uh, uh, is it doesn't need a password? Does it have a date expiry? Do you want to directly invite people? I have it open. And for those of you that have got loads of albums to share, personally or professionally, there's a lot of good options for you there. It still lacks thing recognition, but the fact that this ARM-based processor still has AI photo recognition still wins it for me. And in terms of multimedia and video, We've already touched on that Plex is currently, at the time of recording, not available for this system. But I will say that you do have access to both Video Station and, surprisingly, MB. That's right. MB is still available for this. So, MB right now you can run. I've had to disable MB, and the reason I've disabled it will become very clear very soon as I open it up there. But while I leave that in the background, yes, you've got Video Station. Yes, you can scrape the metadata, although you will need to create uh, a movie database account, which is free, uh, and use an API key to get all the uh, images on your NAS. But again, all the information is there. We can go ahead, play a file, or we can go along, look at some of our test files there. And again, we've still got those trailers as well that we've got for our 4K. And I will say, uh, if I'm playing a file such as this one here, so Into the Cave of Wonders, so let's play into the Cave of Wonders. This is uh, a 4K file, and we've already tested it, as you can see there, and it runs. This is uh, an H.264 file in 4K, and again, this CPU is already, you know, it's already established it can play 4K. We'll leave that to do its thing in the background while it plays that file, and if we look at the CPU, we're seeing those spikes that I mentioned earlier on in the background, but... It is able to play that 4K. The problem lies is when you're trying to play HEVC or H.265 media, either on a device that doesn't have that license, or you're utilizing a device that um, doesn't have the option to client-side transcode. Not a problem for everyone, but just to put that again into perspective. So if we go for uh, Roast Duck here, this is uh, an H.265 file, 8-bit. If we try to play that one, what Video Station will do not supported because I don't have an HEVC license this side and also the NAS doesn't have the hardware to convert it the way it normally would. Now a number of you, if we, and again we will be doing video station testing on this NAS specifically uh, very very soon, but if we go into MB, with MB which is already seeing those spikes, again you can play a lot of these files that are uh, H.264 very very easily so if we go into uh, those 4k test file uh, the 10 HP and 4k test file these are a 1080p file lovely and simple this first one here this is an H.264 file so we, again we can play that works absolutely sweet as a nut there's a slight dip there we can see in that drop in frame rate there again we kind of have to at least uh, respect that OBS is running but at least it is able to play this 8.265 file and indeed if we open that up get the stats for nerds up we're able to see there on the screen that this is indeed an H.264 file there the problem lies if we try to play again something that requires H.265 or HEVC in other words a file like this one because this is what you see nada it will not play, and the system in the background is suddenly going up to that 88% there. And if we go into the resource monitor, you'll see that it is desperately trying to convert that file. It's trying. We can see the FFmpeg um, process there running, desperately trying to convert that file for us. But unfortunately, it just doesn't have that hardware, and it's trying. 
and it's just playing's not possible there. It will really give it the college try, but this system is definitely for those of you that are going to be running systems, and I will definitely be shutting down um, MB while I'm doing this. This system is for users who either are not going to be running HEVC media or have client-side devices that have got an HEVC license or have a HEVC conversion and conversion supported players on their side again you are looking at an affordable nas and luckily that's got rid of that conversion so we're right the way back to normal but do bear that in mind now there's no docker application so we can't run plex in a docker app there is support however of other synology uh, mainstay applications like surveillance station we've got two cameras already connected to this device i hate seagulls um if we can see, if we go into there, we can go into the monitor view. We should have a couple of cameras um, in my network environment. Again, it's, I've not gone into this enough to stop some of those other things happening there. So if we look at the different cameras, we'll drag those in. And again, you've got the bulk of the applications available from um, a surveillance, uh, sorry, services within Surveillance Station for you to utilize there. So they're all good. None of the AI stuff, unsurprisingly, there. Whether when Synology um, uh, cameras arrive, their BC and TC uh, 500 series, whether they will allow those AI services to be used on this is yet to be seen. But again, watch a whole review of Surveillance Station coming up and do a big three part feature series on this very, very soon in time for those cameras arriving. But at least you've got access to the app and again all of those app uh, all the services that were within it there so you get your tailored alerts you've got the alert panel you've got all the stuff of the featured monitoring there and recording switching to old and new using some of the io supported stuff there's even uh, an app center there where we can make our way through where we can add other features and services it's a very well established and exceedingly well put together surveillance platform and i'm really impressed that it arrives with the ds223 now coming out of surveillance station we can talk about that network access we did mention when you're accessing the device we've got the security advisor for you to monitor the device as you can see it's already given me warnings on some of the stuff that i've done thus far because i am running this in a very open breezy way for this video something you guys shouldn't want to do so but using the security advisor will tell you some of the things that you need to either enable disable some of the things that you could revisit in terms of your password having two-step authentication and more and it allows you to scan your network now with regards to remote access you've of course got access to Synology's quick connect platform where you can access your NAS remotely without doing port forwarding and opening up stuff by bouncing off Synology's server. Recent viewers to this channel will know I've talked a little bit about Talscale and I've already um, done a whole video on Talscale and this NAS does support Talscale as well. So along with uh, support of TeamViewer as well, you've got a multitude of different ways to patch into the device where you don't have to muck around with your firewall. You don't have to sort of start punching holes in your port just make sure if you're regardless of using any of these methods get your two-step authentication get your password strengthened and overall don't just trust because you're using an encrypted uh, kind of non-freely accessible uh, tunnel that you can take it easy on the security settings on your NAS you simply can't but apart from that I'm going to make my way back uh, towards the main camera there and summarize today's review overall I'm loving what I'm seeing here and I think the DS223 Yes, it's not exactly going to blow your socks off, but you are getting pretty much the complement of the mainstay appealing application from Synology. It's a shame about the lack of Docker. It's a shame about the back of lack of Plex at this time. Maybe one of you guys can mod one of those packages together and let me know. But let's make our way back to the camera there and summarize our review. So what do I think? Well, obviously, you've got to look at this through the lens of it being a value entry-level point into Synology's ecosystem. And in that world, I would say that this system definitely delivers there. It is a system that's giving you access to the bulk of DSM services there and doing it in one of the most affordable price points from within the brand. So within that particular worldview, it does a very, very good job. But outside of that, then you have to look at what you're getting for your money and the rest of the NAS market as a whole. The fact that it has one GBE, 
not 2.5 GB and those USB ports there are 3.2 Gen 1 at 5 gig. When so many brands out there are giving you better than that for a similar money, for a number of you that not aren't sure whether you're going to take advantage of DSM, there are question marks over whether you are getting the best value for money for you when you're looking at the broader spectrum of NAS devices in the market. Yes, Synology have more powerful solutions right now than this. And again, I am still convinced there is going to be, if not a DS223+, Plus, than another multimedia style two-bay from the brand in the relative near future. And for those users, jumping on the bandwagon with the 223+, Plus is a value series when that inevitable uh, entry and follow-up to the DS220+, Plus will only cost you, you know, 80 to 100 quid difference more. It might be worth staying on the fence just a little bit longer there for those reasons. But what about other good things about this device that actually do make it appealing to you? Maybe you don't need to wait any longer. And to those users, I say DSM. Having most of those applications, yes, you don't get Docker, you don't get VMs, you don't get Active Backup or SHA, but you are getting as a very capable central data system for your home, for your family members, for your colleagues there. And if you are someone that's only looking for this thing as a target for your storage and you weren't looking to upgrade the greater network speed or anything, it's a really, really good box that runs on low noise, it runs on low energy consumption, and with the compatibility limitations that we've seen in some of the other higher profile devices in Synology's lineup, this having a much broader spectrum of compatibility with hard drives and SSDs is really not too big questions. It's got the three USB ports there for adding more stuff. It's got support of SHR when you do want to upgrade later on, support of snapshots and snapshot replication. Then you've got support of BTRFS as well. And with Synology Drive and the backup tools there with retention policies, schedule policies, filters and more, it's a very customizable platform yet still remains incredibly user friendly for most users and i guess it would be remiss not to at least highlight that plex media server not being supported on this right now is going to be something that a lot of you are going to be disappointed about again you can't be angry at synology for that but plex almost certainly will roll out a version of its application for server use on this device and i think it will do well even early mb testing and synology's own video station testing on this for you home users has proven very well to, uh, well performed on this device just bear in mind that hevc and h.265 native server side support is limited at best and if you're not using a client device that can convert or at least have an HEVC license, you're going to hit something of a barrier while using it. But as a value series NAS from Synology, it's a good follow-up. It does, definitely does not reinvent the wheel compared with that of the 218 before it. And if anything, it's a small upgrade in the grand scheme of things. But it was always a good value box to start with. And given how long people have waited for an upgrade to the 218, there's going to be different users out there that think this isn't a big enough step. But then with the cost of hardware these days, I think a lot of us had to accept that Synology weren't exactly going to put a lot of change on this existing formula of value to bay. But this has been our review of the DS223. Do look forward to the much shorter review and our should you buy before you buy very, very soon. We'll be doing multimedia testing on this and revisiting things like surveillance and drive on it just to see how its performance of some of those applications compares with that of the DS723 powerhouse unit. Because a number of you are gonna be wondering, Given the price difference and the hardware difference between these two devices, it's going to be very interesting to see, in terms of DSM, what exactly that difference is. It can't just be about power, right? So stay tuned for that. But thank you so much for watching. There's a link in the description to the written review for the DS223 Plus below. So go down there to find out more about that. If you've enjoyed the video, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. If you need free advice, if you are still kind of lost in the woods, can't see the wood for the trees, and you still don't, you've been, you know, boning up on hours of education about these devices and you're still on the fence, use the free advice section link below to NAS Compares, the big blue button on the right-hand side. If you need community support, there's a free community support forum with me, Eddie, and members of the NAS community to answer your questions. And finally, if this video has helped you, and if you were going to go to Amazon anyway, please use the links in the description below. It costs you nothing extra to use them and it takes you to Amazon anyway and anything, and I mean anything you buy there results in a small kickback coming back to here as compares just me and Eddie here doing this and it allows us to continue doing what we do. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.